move to Cheney University as the Office of Student Activities continues to celebrate black history. Tonight, we welcome a group, some for the first time and others who are returning home. This group of men, coupled with brains and brawn, fought and flew to preserve our country's freedom, a country that at the time had little regard for them. In fact, although blacks had shown the ability to fly, this letter concerning the color troop problem was sent to General Eisenhower at the War Department. From the standpoint of military efficiency, the lower average intelligence rating of colored selectees is an obstacle to broad employment of colored soldiers throughout a modern, highly mechanized army. This limitation has been stressed by many officers who have had training supervision over the colored Negroes. Lack of an educational background, plus the apparent lack of mechanical specialists from the colored units. Those who point out that Negroes can be educated and trained within the Army fail to evaluate the time factor that is involved. At present, the Army cannot perform the function of an educational institute for the individual and at the same time prepare a large, efficient fighting force quickly. Therefore, they decided that there should be colored troops and the Army should be separate. In 1939, colored African-American pilots were invited to join the Civilian Pilot Training Program. Also, in 1939, they were able to become the national a part of the National Airmen's Association. However, militarily, it was not until March 22nd, 1941, despite the opposition of the Army Air Corps and the War Department, that the Tuskegee Army Airfield became the training center for not only the 99th, but all black fighter pilots during World War I. Okay, now, okay, I forgot what I said. I apologize, World War II. Okay, but before we speak to those who have lived through it, before we introduce you to our guests, I'd like to ask you if you could please join me in enjoying a bit of Tuskegee Airmen history through video. of time more inspiring words written than those that read that all men are created equal. Sadly, for many, these same words proved a hollow promise left to echo in time, resounding as a mockery of inequality that would demand years of struggle overshadowed by bitter disappointment. Equality was to remain an elusive dream. The dim light of hope never blazed brighter for black Americans than during an era in American history when they began challenging the discriminatory practices of the armed forces. Key to the demands of major black organizations, such as the NAACP, the National Urban League, and others, was for the designation of centers where Negroes could be trained for work in all branches of the Aviation Corps. It was not enough to train pilots alone, but navigators, bombardiers, gunners, radio men, and even mechanics. Under this collective pressure, Congress made concessions by passing Public Law 18. Under its directive, 
an air school to prepare blacks for military service was authorized. 91 of the 100 young Negro college students enrolled in the civilian pilot training program qualified for civil licenses during 1939 and 1940. In spite of all these facts, the Army Air Corps refused to alter its stand and allow blacks to fly. In 1941, with guidance from the NAACP, a Howard University student named Yancey Williams filed suit against the War Department to compel his admission to an air training center. Almost immediately, the War Department responded by announcing that it would establish an air unit near Tuskegee Institute, Alabama, the 99th Pursuit Squadron. Activated March 21st, 19... Fighting 99th began training ground support troops at Chanute Field, Illinois. Eager young black Americans received specialized training in maintenance engineering, armament, and communications. Just a few months later, an inaugural address was given at the Tuskegee Institute, initiating the training of black aviators for the United States Army Air Corps. This hard-fought privilege brought with it a great responsibility. The nation was watching, and the fate of future black military aviation rested in the hands of these intrepid young flyers. In a bold and inspiring departure from the expected, the contract for construction of Tuskegee Army Airfield was awarded to the firm of McKissick and McKissick, headed by a black architect and engineer. In July, construction began on the facility for basic and advanced flying training. The first class for pilots consisted of 12 cadets and one military officer, Captain Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. It commenced primary flying training July 19, 1941, at Moton Field. Soon, young Tuskegee graduates would show the world they could not only fly, but fight. Shortly after graduating in the first class of 1942, Second Lieutenant Charles DeBow was stopped on the street by a white civilian and asked, you one of those new colored flyers over at Tuskegee? He proudly answered that he was. Tell me one thing, what do you boys want to fly for anyhow? He was asked. Shocked but not surprised, DeBow said he couldn't really think of an adequate answer at the time but afterward realized the simple elegance of his answer. He was flying for his country. He felt he had a job to do for his country and his race. And just as Booker T. Washington and George Washington Carver had proven themselves as educator and scientist, he might prove to someone that Negroes could become good pilots and officers. Armed only with their bravery and determination, fueled by dreams of dignity for others like themselves. Lieutenant DeBow and four of his fellow pioneers, Captain Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., Second Lieutenant Lemuel R. Custis, Second Lieutenant George S. Roberts, and Second Lieutenant Mac Ross, became the first graduates paving the way for the other 961 black military aviators who were trained at Tuskegee Army Airfield during World War II. Under the command of Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., 450 of the graduates served as fighter pilots, attaining dignity and glory in the aerial war over North Africa, Sicily, and Europe. P-40s, P-39s, P-47s, and P-51 type aircraft. The 99th Squadron became the 332nd Fighter Group, which also included the 100th, 301st, and 302nd Fighter Squadrons. Together, they flew 15,553 sorties and completed 1,578 missions with the 12th Tactical U.S. Army Air Force and the 15th Strategic U.S. Army Air Force. And with each and every mission, 
Yet another victory was achieved, not just for the nation, but for a people as well. The interesting common fact that surrounded all of their backgrounds was that all of them had wanted to fly. Well, I started out with these young people back in a black air force in Europe in World War II. Performance is the absolute key in combat. To protect the bombers, to prevent them from getting shot down by enemy fighters, the 99th Pursuit Squadron was an expert in dropping bombs and hitting targets and hitting locomotives. It was also an expert in aerial combat. The 99th Squadron did one thing at Anzio that no other squadron did. It shot down 16 enemy airplanes. Uh, yesterday, I fulfilled one of my ambitions as a combat pilot. I got one airplane. This was my country. I wanted a piece of it. I had to fight for it. But I'll be damned if I was going to let some other country come in and take it over. Though no real plans had been made for their usage, by mid-1943, Negro candidates were being screened to determine their relative aptitude as pilots for multi-engine aircraft, as well as bombardiers and navigators. Class 43J was the first at Tuskegee with about half of its members training in the multi-engine Beechcraft AT-10, hoping that the bomb group program would actually develop. The first air cadets to train outside Tuskegee were the navigators who graduated at Hondo Field, Texas, February 26, 1944. The 477th Bombardment Group was officially activated January 15, 1944 at Selfridge Field. Although the 477th never entered combat due to the war's end, their struggle for equality and performance as military professionals, along with the magnificent wartime record of the 99th and 332nd, led to a reversal of the U.S. War Department's racial policies. In 1946, Tuskegee Army Airfield closed. Shortly after its closing, the former base commander, Colonel Noel Parrish, in discussing the success of the flying school, said the following. How good were our pilots? How good is any pilot? Our men were good enough to graduate from any flying school in the country. We made sure of that. And working together, we proved it. We emphasized that a pilot or a man of whatever color, size, or shape is just as good as he proves himself to be. Men and pilots have to be considered as individuals. We have had some of the worst pilots in the world right here, and we have had some of the best. In the first place, they flew and fought as men. They may have had pretty good alibis for being failures if they wanted to use these alibis. Or they may have been proud of their group as the only one like it in the world, as they had a right to be. But when the test came, they had to fly and fight just as men. Americans against a common enemy. Today, there are over 425,000 black Americans serving in the armed forces as an integral part of the defense of this great nation. Their position in the military, their communities, and indeed the world has been attained and preserved through achievement and honor. The direct result of commitment to their ideals and dedication to their dreams. In the early days at Tuskegee, in addition to the already difficult job of flying, we trained under the additional pressures of segregation. But we had no time for self-pity or despair. We were too busy preparing ourselves for a career of service to our nation. The state of our fully integrated Air Force today is a pretty good indication that we did a good job. But that doesn't mean that the future will be a rose garden that there will not be other obstacles to overcome. Freedom must be repurchased by every new generation. When the Tuskegee Flying Program was offered to America's black youngsters, we were ready. We had prepared ourselves for this opportunity, and when it presented itself, we grabbed it with both hands. Prepare yourself so that when your Tuskegee appears, you will be ready. Must 
Freedom must be repurchased by every new generation. Prepare yourself so that when your Tuskegee appears, you will be ready. because Dr. Crocker in each of our meetings reminded me, although their counterparts didn't think they had the intellect to learn to fly, most of the pilots who trained had already gone past high school and had attained college degrees. First to greet us, we have Mr. Pierce T. Ramsey, Sr., who currently serves as the president of the Greater Philadelphia Chapter. He will speak to us about the Tuskegee Airmen and also 477 Bombardment Group. Mr. Ramsey. Thank you. And good evening, everyone. I was a B-25 pilot, which is a, a light bomber, and we were part of the 477 Bombardment Group. Our bombardment group was destined for Asia, whereas our fighter group fought in Europe and Italy. We uh, were eager, eager to go, but they dropped the bombs in Japan a little too soon for us to get over there. I want to complain about this jacket. It gets smaller. It seems to get smaller. <laughs> anyway, I'm the current president of the Philadelphia Contingency. But I'd like to point out to you that uh, we have airmen all over the United States. We have some 38 to 40 chapters now in most of the large cities in, uh, in, the, in the country. I, uh, I'm not going to say too much. We have some bombardiers here, we have navigators, and we have pilots. We have fighter pilots and bomber pilots. But I want to introduce to you Dr. Bernard Proctor, who was part and parcel of the 99th Pursuit Squadron. 
Dr. Proctor. Good evening, Ted. Good evening. Good evening, all. Good evening. Black men wanted to enlist in the military immediately following World War I, but they were unsuccessful. An October 30, 1925 document from the Army War College influenced greatly not admission of blacks to the military. And I quote now from the document at the close of the meeting, copies of documents will be distributed to hopefully to all of you here, and a copy of this document will be included. Memorandum Chief of Staff, Washington Barracks, D.C., Army War College, October the 30th, 1925. Facts bearing upon the problem of the use of Negro manpower in the war. One, the Negro is physically qualified for combat duty. Next, he is by nature subservient and believes himself to be inferior to the white man. <laughs> He is most susceptible to the influence of crowd psychology. He cannot control himself in the fear of danger to the extent of the white man. He has not the initiative and resourcefulness of the white man. He is mentally inferior to the white man. This is what your government thought about us. But speaking for members of the 99th Fighter Squadron and the Tuskegee Airmen at large, we didn't have to read the document because most of us had learned individually and collectively, spend time on the positive and not on the negative, on the solution and not on the problem. I was uh, assigned to the 99th Fighter Squadron at the Tuskegee Army Flying School on July the 24th, 1943. I was not a flying officer. I had already graduated from college and had been commissioned as an infantry officer. So I imagine they, that's why they sent me there, hoping that if we ever got in trouble, that maybe this guy might help us out. <laughs> we were ready to go into combat on, in September the 6th of 1943, but nobody wanted us. Just as nobody wanted, cities didn't want us, nobody wanted us, didn't want us in the South Pacific, they didn't want us over in Europe. But uh, later on, we received orders, and on April the 2nd, 1943, 287 enlisted men under the leadership of Colonel Benjamin O. Davis, along with 29 pilots and 14 non-pilots, we left Tuskegee, a place called Chihaw. Those of us who were down there know what we mean, Chihaw. She was a, Chihaw was a segregated train station about one-eighth as big as this room, this room. So that was it. So we left Chihaw on the morning of April the 2nd, <coughs> arrived in Camp Shanks, New York on April the 4th, on, got ready there on April the 11th, Colonel Davis received a notice notifying him that he was senior member of the troops, line officer, and therefore he and his staff of four, of which I was included, we were in charge of the ship from New York on the 16th of April until Casablanca on the 14th of April, 1943. We had trouble the first couple of nights, but after the uh, commander of the ship threatened to throw any commanding officers in the brig who caused any trouble, life was peaceful then. We <coughs> went from Casablanca to a place called Unj in French Morocco. That's where we trained until the 29th of May, 1943, we left Unja, which was on the west side of Africa, traveled 1,200 miles to a place called Farjuno on Cape Bone. 
Now, even at that stage of the war, most of the time, we were split. We had an advanced group, we had a ground group. Sometimes the ground group went in this type of battle. We went into combat with the 33rd Fighter Group on the second day of June, 1943. Man by the name of Bill Camel, soldier by the name of Bill Camel and Charles Hall, they first flew with the 33rd Fighter Group wings. That was bombing of the island of Panateria. From the time that we joined the 33rd Fighter Group, he didn't want us. And from the time we stayed with him in North Africa and later in Sicily, he tried to get us sent home. Fortunately, Colonel Davis was in the United States at the time the hearing came up. This is in the HBO, and so um, we stayed with him. The invasion of Italy came, and that gave us, at that particular time then, we were relieved from assignment with the 33rd in Sicily, and we were assigned to the 79th Fighter Group. This was a group that had come out of Africa, a seasoned group in the British Empire. The day that we drove up into the area and a sign on the bulletin board, the All Black Squadron is joining us today. You stay in your area and you stay in yours. However, that never happened. Colonel Early Bates, the commanding officer of the group, integrated us on the October the 17th of 1943. He mixed black, white, black, white. In fact, for the first time and the last time, from October the 17th until the 1st of April, we were not black, we were not white. For the first time in our lives, we basically were human beings. We lived in British sector, we slept in British tents, we ate British rations. On the 16th of April, 16th of January in 1944, we moved with the 79th to Naples, the Capitacino Airfield, uh, later on, the part of the 332nd came there. We flew, started flying then. Charlie Hall shot down the first enemy plane in, on July 2nd of 1943. And it was at Anzio on the 27th of January, 1943, 1944. All of this time, they said that blacks couldn't fly in combat, even after they learned to fly the airplane. But on the morning of the 27th of January, Clarence Jamison led a flight of 12. Those of us who lived, you lived every day, from July the 2nd until the 27th of January. We shot down no planes because basically no planes were available. We did what you call close support work, bombing, strafing. If there was trouble, if they were having trouble like up at the uh, Wade Wilson building, those guys would come in there with the dive bombing and strafing and could drop a bomb. Even though we were criticized by Mo Mai and tried to send us home, we received a unit citation for our dive bombing work in Sicily. This was a presidential unit citation. As usual, morning broke. Those of us who were on the ground waited, and after about an hour, five ships came in, buzzed the field, slow rolled, and we knew what that meant. Five that morning. They took off, another flight took off that afternoon and shot down three. 
That was eight. They rolled and so forth and ate for the day. We parted that night. <laughs> because of what it meant then that forever in a day, and we were sent into combat without one person that had had any experience in combat. So we parted that night. The next day they went out on the 28th and shot down four more. That made us even happier, and of course, the word reached out to many of them. Luther Smith, who will speak shortly, was a member of the 332nd, and I think they probably heard about it on board the ship. And they landed on the 29th. We followed them with shooting down one on the first, the uh, 3rd of February, and then three more on the 7th of February. So following that then, and later on after we left the group and moved forward, we received another citation. What it meant to us was, and it was a strain for, for all of us. In fact, that particular group of us for somehow during the war, this was our only contact that we had. We served with the 324th Fighter Group. We served with the 86th Fighter Group. Missions were phoned in. We didn't know evidently what they were and what was expected. So again, Colonel Bates is still alive. I write to him every now and then. He's uh, receive a Christmas card from him. But on the January the 27th and 28th, February the 3rd, 1944, and February the 7th, we said what it meant was that we proved that the color of one's skin has nothing to do with the toughness of one's heart. And the quality of one's brain does, unless one permits it to be that small, that the group realized that forever in a day, no one could again ever question whether or not black men can fly and maintain and service airplanes in combat. I thank you. <laughs>